I remember when I was here when the, the community centre had just been opened and Dr. Musharraf was saying we're getting a bit of opposition from the locals. And I said, well, if they don't like it, they should move. <laughs> and, 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 and when I told Sheikh Abdul this, he said, no, no, no. He said, let them eat curry meat. <laughs> and, and it is a wisdom because this is how many people actually come to the deen just by being attracted by the generosity of the Muslims and, and, and their hospitality and their welcome. And, and one of the times when the nafs doesn't cause any trouble is when you're doing dhikr and, and when you're eating, usually, you know, if you're eating in measure. So, um, I, I can feel already that this is a completely different place now to when I was last here in those beginning days. And, and what has brought it alive is the hearts of the people who are here, the hearts of the people who come and use the centre and who worship a lot in it and um, to, who increase their knowledge by, by, by studying in it. And this, this is the sign of, of your being on the Sirat al-Mustaqim, and this is the sign of Allah's favour on Dr. Musharraf and, and on your community. And it's true that uh, I can't remember mm -hmm. Sheikh who said, you only obtain success by keeping the company of someone who has obtained success, by keeping the company of someone who obtained success. And this is what has happened uh, to the people of knowledge all the way back to the Rasul. This is why the Sahaba were successful, because they kept the company of the Rasul. And then the people who kept their company, the people who kept their company up to the present. And Sheikh Bukhara once said to me that sincerity to your Sheikh is a portion of ikhlas, it's a portion of sincerity. And of course, real sincerity, as we know from Surah Al-Ikhlas, is confirming the absolute reality of Allah. There's no mention of the slave in Surah Al-Ikhlas. It's just about Allah. And if you affirm that, then you are sincere. And it's, it's true, as Dr. Musharraf says, that everything that has come to me has come through my Shaykh. Even my entering Islam was through meeting Shaykh Abdul Qadim. And, and he, he once said in a talk that um, if, if, if Allah is merciful to you, he puts you in a corner so that you have no choice but to accept Islam. And if Allah loves you, then he puts you in a corner, a zawiyah, with a teaching sheikh. So you can really find out what it's about. And, and uh, alhamdulillah, Allah has been so generous to me in, in making this happen through my sheikh. And I remember Sheikh Bukhara once said, uh, and he wasn't boasting, but he said you could write a book about just one of my sentences uh, because he's written so much and, and somehow his, his words are so concentrated without being tied up in grammatical constructs. You know, they're, they're, it's very free, it's almost like a hologram sometimes, what, what his sentence is conveying. It's conveying what you could never really put into words until he's done it. And so often so much comes from that when you read. And um, certainly the book on the Dajjal came out from one of his sentences nice. that he was giving in a talk and he said there's three aspects of the Dajjal. Dajjal the individual, Dajjal the social and cultural phenomenon, and Dajjal an unseen force. And um, really it was that uh, sentence that sparked something in me to, to, uh, to write this book and it was also combined with uh, really veils being taken away from my heart that everything that I had been brought up to consider normal, I suddenly realized that a whole lot of it was not normal, it was kufr. You know, and that now I had a new normal, which was, was kind of Islam and Iman, you know, Ihsan. That was, this was the real normal. And, and, and um, this other nonsense that I had been brought up in, and, and I don't blame my parents in any respect, they were very fine people, and Allah bless them and forgive them their wrong actions, and, and be jealous of them on the Qiyamah and in the Akhra, but they, they didn't know any better, and neither did my teachers at school, and they, so what I was taught was a mixture of good and bad, but certainly no one ever taught me about Islam, any aspect of it, while I was at school or at university, uh, and um, this was part of the reason why I was driven to Islam, was by knowing that after all this wonderful education, I went to the best schools, the best university, um, I still didn't understand life, I didn't know where I was coming from or where I was going to, and, and really I was completely at sea w without knowing which direction I was pointing, and I didn't have a Qibla then, you see. And um, 
But because of that transition, I was able um, to see clearly the difference, if you like, between Kufr and Iman. And, and this was part of the impetus of, of writing the book on the Dajjal, by suddenly having access to reading the signs, uh, as, as Allah says in the Quran, the signs in the self and on the horizon. You know, he says, Allah says there are ayat. You know, we were surrounded by ayats. Each one of us was an ayat. There are ayats in our heart. So we never, once our heart is alive, we never stop finding out. Every day is different. Every day there's a fresh knowledge. Every day there's a fresh state. And, and, um, and so then life becomes this really kind of interesting uh, voyage of discovery. And um, you don't sort of think, oh, you know, um, what do I do now? You know, there's so much to do. You think, Allah, you know, please let me live a bit longer so I can do all these other things that I want to do before it's time for me to move on. Uh, and so we look at life in a completely different way to the people who think that this world is all there is. I was actually thinking of that as I was driving up um, this evening, how I would begin the talk. And, and of course, it never turns out the way I'm thinking. But I was going to say, you know, has the security done a check? You know, is there, I hope they haven't found anyone, you know, a young man with wild hair and one eye. And as the many Dr. Bashar have confirmed that no, no so such person has been identified, then I'd say, well, that means we're, we're safe from the Dajjal tonight. And um, this was sometimes how the Prophet وسلم, talked about the Dajjal. He, he was dismissive of, of him, as if he was nothing. Uh, and, um, but then the Sahaba said also that at other times when he spoke about the Dajjal, uh, it, it was so frightening that we felt that he was close and, and was going to attack us, and, and we were apprehensive about how we would deal with the situation. So this is, there are aspects of this. When you look at what the Prophet ﷺ has said about the Dajjal, you see in fact that he is the epitome of Kufra, he is the epitome of evil. And, and it's a mighty evil, you know, he has miracles that even when the people of right action respond with the right action, they, they don't seem to have any effect. Uh, you know, some of the descriptions of, of the Dajjal when, when he's traveling the earth and, and um, opening up the treasuries of the earth and, and uh, you know, when he calls people to a false religion, if they don't accept it, th then they suffer with famine and illness. And you, it's almost like a description of, of North Africa, you know, it's of, of Somalia and Sudan, when they've had these uh, awful droughts. And I, I was very lucky because I traveled in those lands um, before all the tragedies that have happened in the last 30 years. And, and they were such refreshing places to be, that people were so natural. Um, everyone had a smile on their face. That, that was just part of how they were, part of how they lived. And, and, and in fact, in Sudan, they have a saying, they say, when Allah created the Sudan, he smiled. You know, this is how they <laughs> describe it. And, and, um, and part of this was because their Islam was still very much alive. Um, people would think you were a bit odd if you didn't have a share. Whereas um, now, in a lot of parts of the world, if, if people are thinking you are a bit odd if you do have a share, <laughs> it's completely upside down. And um, this, this was what we've seen is how, how, how the deen there has come under attack. You know, somehow the collection of the zakat in terms of all the crops has been abandoned. You know, they've been growing cash crops for high-tech north consumption. And, and as a result, when the drought comes, the grain that normally would have been stored by the collection of the zakat is not there to feed the hungry, and then they become dependent on foreign aid. And, and it becomes a nightmare of, you know, with these refugee camps of tattered plastic and you know, people really just existing or dying as, as, as they can't exist anymore. It's, it's tragic. But this is an aspect of the Dajjal as a system, you could say. Um, it's a manifestation of how people live who, when the Dajjal, the individual, comes, they will say, he's our, he's our man, you know, he's our leader, he's, our, he, he's the leader we've been waiting for. And um, he will be the leader of the Kuffar. Uh, I sometimes think that, in fact, when, when the, the Yahud say, oh, we're, waiting, we're still waiting for the Messiah, you know, Sidna Isa wasn't the Messiah, that their Messiah 
this Messiah, a Dajjal, as, as he's described in the Hadith, you know, he's the, the Messiah, who is the Dajjal, but the Dajjal, what does it mean? It means the one who deceives. He's, he's the deceiver. So, uh, for example, some of the descriptions is that he will, he will show you fire, um, but it won't burn you. He will show you water, but you won't be able to drink it. Uh, he will show you the garden and make it seem like it's the fire. He will show you the fire and make it seem like it's the garden. And in a way, this is almost the way images come to us from, the te from our televisions. These, these are the kinds of deceptions that come in you and the, the news that comes. Um, is often very misleading. It's not actually what's happening. That there may be a, a, a kind of real-time photographic Im images coming to you, but the actual interpretation of what is happening is, is, is not what actually is happening. And, you know, I remember Shabbat Kodah once saying there, there are 30 Dajjals, you know, small d, and the television is one of them. And, and yet somehow we live in a, in a world where we all have a screen in front of us, most of us, in, in an increasing amount of the day. So the thing is you can't throw them all out of the window, you know, like, like the Taliban did, but you have to say, we have to learn how to deal with it. We have to learn how to use it in a useful way, but not be deceived by it. People say, you know, that the time must be close. Um, there are signs of the ayam, of fitan, you know, the days, the end days, the, the days of, of test, of fitna. Uh, and many of the, the lesser signs are, are all around us, you know, the poor people building tall buildings in which people exalt themselves. Uh, you know, I mean, you see it kind of almost more in the Gulf than you do in, in, in any of the cities in America or Europe. And, and um, I remember once I was visiting Dubai and back in 1986, it was quite a while ago, and there were all these buildings going up there, all these people in rags building them, living in shanty town, <coughs> on the edge of town, you know, out of, out of sight of the tourists. And there was this one mujdub in the market selling perfumes, and he was singing this uh, kind of uh, extempore um, kawali, saying, you know, oh, what, can't you see what you've lost? Can't you see what you've lost? You've lost the dean, more for this rubbish, you know. And uh, you know, he was laughing and smiling, selling perfume, but um, he was a free man in, in all of that. Um, but all, all the other signs of you know, alcohol being drunken in great quantities, of, of um, zina being a norm, and, and that the modest people who are the ones who only commit zina in private, you know, rather than openly. You know, that, 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 that is the level that modesty has been reduced to. Uh, when, when, the, when, the, when the Prophet Sallallahu talked about modesty, it was a completely different level of, of adab, uh, which as Dr. Musharraf was saying, is, is so important. You know, adab is the key to everything in life. If you don't have adab, you will never get anywhere. And um, you, you know, the, all, all of the corruption of, of people's sexual behavior has become a norm. You know, people are considered odd if they follow the sunnah of the Prophet And the, the other signs such as, as, as um, women are numbering men, it's a reality today, of women working as well as men so that there's not really anyone to look after the children in a traditional way. Because as we know, the Rasul said that the mother is the madrasa. You know, at the feet of the mother is the garden. And, and, and that means she's, she brings up her children in a garden-like situation, but it also in such a way that it leads her children eventually to the garden. This aspect of life is, is um, it's, it's very difficult for even for the Muminun and the Muminat to actually keep going in this kind of society that we live in today. But as well as these kind of minor signs, you know, also another sign is, is um, people bearing false witness. And, and there's a ruwai in, in, in the, the Muatta when someone comes to Sidna Umar and he says, you won't believe it, but I've come across someone bearing false testimony. He said, oh, Udha Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeeb. You know, how could this happen in, in our lifetime? Like they knew it was a, a sign that would come later, but how could it be happening now? Af, after the example we've been given, after the company that we've kept, how could people behave like this? Uh, but now it's common. It's commonplace. People will do it just to make a bit of money. Uh, another sign that people will wish they were dead, they'll pass the graveyard and say, oh God, I wish I was in there, this life is too much. 
the, 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 the sign of riba, you know, usury being widespread. And, and everyone is implicated in it. Everyone is born into debt nowadays, whether they know it or not. Uh, you know, the whole financial system is, is drenched in riba. It's kind, of, um, it's kind of almost like radioactive contamination. You know, it's in everything in society. It's very difficult to actually have a really halal transaction. You know, with really halal food. I remember the, the Raja of Mahmudabad, who, with whom I said Shahada, I heard a story about him that um, he was once offered some food and he said, thank you very much, but I don't know if it's come from a completely halal source. I don't know, you know, what, where the field in which, you know, something very simple like chapatis. I don't know the field where the, where the, where the, where the corn was grown. You know, I don't know the, the akhlaq of the person who, who was planting it. I, I don't know his transactions when he ground it and sold it in the market. I don't know what processes it had been. So thank you very much. Uh, and he wasn't being insulting, but he said, you know, I just want to be sure that what I eat is halal. You know, that was his wara, his meticulousness. But um, th these, in a way, are minor signs. We're almost used to it now. You know, we almost take it for granted that, yes, we live in these times. It is a time when to be a Muslim is like handling hot coals. You know, it's sometimes difficult. You know, nowadays, if you wear a turban, you'll be accused of being an extremist. And yet the Rasul Salaam said, where, you know, where the Imama, where the Imama to differentiate you from the Jews and the Christians. Um, and, and I've seen it, you know, especially just in the last, say, ten years, over the last space of ten years, when I've been to the Haramein and the Allah's been generous to me and taking me there every two years or so. Every time I go, there's less and less people, less and less men, actually wearing a turban. And you try and get a, a green turban cloth in Metro Medina, it's impossible. No one sells it. Although it was one of the colours that was most beloved to the Muslims. You know, he said that there's three things that you can look on as long as you want without your eyes getting tired. Running water, the colour green, and the face of a woman or woman up. Because they're, you know, they're refreshing. <laughs> and, and yet just to get a simple thing like a green turban, you know, I've been trying for the last five years, I still haven't found it. So, so this is a sign of the times. And in spite of that, um, the Muslims, you know, nothing can keep us down. You know, we heard that wonderful recitation from Pari earlier on, you know, straight from the heart, just bubbling out, like from a fountain in the unseen, uh, and, and, and permeating all of our hearts, uh, far beyond what we could think, what the meaning was. You know, it, it actually has an effect on the heart, that, that resonance. And this, in fact, is what in the end will, ch will change the people around this community center and any Muslim community, just the sound of the Quran being recited, the sound of zikra, actually transforms, it has a transformative effect. Just in the same way that, you know, kind of um, hothouse gases kind of break everything down, or oil pollution breaks everything down, zikra of Allah brings everything to life. And it's like that film E.T., you know, when he, when he touches the plant, it kind of suddenly comes alive. It's almost, it's what I call the E.T. effect. It's like that. Uh, it, it, gives life. And, and nothing can stop that. H however much uh, the kuffar try and make us follow their, their system, and Allah says in the Quran, they won't be happy with you until you do, uh, they can't. You know, what we have is, is not for sale and, and it can't be pulled out of us like a tooth is pulled out of your mouth. No one can take iman out of your heart. I remember when I said the, the shahada with the, with the Raja, he, the first thing he said to me was, he said, no one can bring you to Islam and no one can take you away from it. And I realized at that point that, you know, saying the shahada was just one step, but I had a lot more steps to take. You actually had to find out what it meant. And, and he said, no one can bring you to it, no one can take you away from it. And this is our reality. That the people that Allah blesses with the deen, we haven't. And, and we can only perfect it, we can only improve it, we can only extend our knowledge. Uh, we can only purify our hearts more. Um, Nothing the kuffar do can stop it. I remember, sorry, that's why I should just mention that after the, the minor signs, then obviously they're, they're the major signs. The major signs before the, the Qiyamah. And some are before the coming of Siddha Isa, and some are after the coming of Siddha Isa. So the ones before um, are the appearance of the Dajjal, the person. Uh, the appearance of the Mahdi, the person. 
the fight between the people of the Dajjal and the people of the Mahdi. This will be a reality. And, and from what one can see in the Hadith, it will be happening mainly uh, in, in, in the Holy Land, in, in, in Palestine, in, fact. In, in Syria, Iraq, you know, what, what used to be called Sham, that whole area. And then the return of Sidna Isa, uh, and, and he will come, in, inshallah, in, in, in Damascus. And um, him, him then confronting the Dajjal and his people and um, destroying the Dajjal by, by a miracle. <coughs> in, 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 the, in the Hadith, the description is that when the Dajjal sees Sidna Isa, he, he will melt like lead, or he will dissolve like salt dissolves in water. You know, just because that, whatever that nur that Sidna Isa has, it will just cheer up this, the deception of the Dajjal for what it is, which is nothing. You know, that whole kind of hypnotic magic that, that is the sunnah of Firaun and his magicians, just as it dissolved before the, the miracle of, of Sidna Musa when he, he threw his staff down it, and it did become a real snake. It didn't, wasn't that it seemed to be a snake, it became a snake so that even Musa was bright, because it might bite me. You know, so, and when the magicians saw that, they said, what he has is greater than us, because we were just tricking people. So. That, that's the real snake. So then they, they said the Shahad, you know, we believe in the, in the, in the Rabb of, of Musa. And even when Pharaoh said, what, you know, without my permission, you know, I'll have you crucified. You know, turn it, hands and feet cut off, hanging up on the roadside. They said, you can hurt us in the dunya, but you can't. You can't hurt us in the Akhir. So, so something had happened to their hearts. Um, so in the same way, this is the, the clarity of what Sidna Isa, it's something we can't really imagine. I, I, I really long and hope that maybe we'll live long enough to see that happen. Allahu Alam. I remember Shabbat Bukhara once saying, a um, long time ago now, but he said, you may just still be alive when this is the return. But he said, Allahu Alam. You know, only, only Allah knows. Nobody knows. I mean, you get some stupid people who say, oh yeah, the Dajjal, you know, next, next year, you know, this month, this <laughs> time, this Ramadan, this Lail Tukada. And of course it never happens because it's not like that. Um, Nobody knows, no one has knowledge of the hour, except for Allah. And, and, and in fact, no one has knowledge of the future, except for Allah. There's, there's a wonderful story of, of um, uh, I, I can't remember who it was, it was someone, you know, well-known, a scholar, but he was ill, and he actually saw the angel of death standing at the foot of his, where he was lying. And, and he said, you know, how long have I got? And the angel of death held up his hand like that, you know, with five fingers showing. And he said, five what? You know, five minutes, five hours, five days, five months, five years? You know, and then the angel of death disappeared. And then he went to a man of knowledge and he said, what does that mean? Five, you know, what? And, and, and the man said, he's referring to the ayat of Quran. And when Allah says, there are five things which only Allah knows, you know, that, that the hour, you know, when the rain will fall, when, when, the, when the womb will become pregnant, you know, when, when the, the seed will um, germinate, uh, where you will die, when you will die, what you will enter on the morrow. You know, these, these things, are the, I think it's the sort of made us. Yeah. So he, he was just saying, I don't know. I, I may be the angel of death, but I, I don't know for sure how long you've got. But when the command comes, I'll take you off. You know, that's it. Um, we just say Takbir, everybody. Louder than that. Come on. Takbir. Narayan Sala. Good. So we don't know. We don't know when the Dajjal, the individual, will actually appear. But I, every so often you kind of get intimations. I remember there was one um, sheikh from Medina, Sheikh Bashir Uthman, who was the, the murid of a very famous sheikh there, Sheikh al-Bukhari, who died several years ago now. Sheikh Bashir also died more recently. But he once said, you know, the, 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 the Dajjal is alive in Arabia, the, the, the Mahdi is alive in Arabia, it's not long. Mm. And, and he said when that, when that conflict happens, he said all the technology will fail. You know, all that high-tech, uh, precision, which means now someone in front of a screen can direct a drone to blow up a village uh, in Pakistan. 
Uh, you know, and the news will say, oh, uh, there was a suspected insertion there, you know, so we wiped them all out just to make sure. You know, we, we didn't even bother to charge them with any crime or, or bring them before a court or even take them to Bagram or Guantanamo Bay. We just kill them. You know, this is the arrogance of the Kufa. Uh, but all of that technology will suddenly, it won't work. So it will be person to person, which, which is, is the human <coughs> way that conflict happens in, in a real way. It's person to person. Um, but he kind of gave that information, and that was you know, probably more than 25 years ago now. So you know, I'm not holding my breath, and I'm not telling you to hold your breath either. But I did hear a story this last Ramadan, which was very interesting, that there was a taxi driver in, in Mecca, uh, and in his dream, he dreamt that you know, he was driving as usual as when he's awake in his taxi in, in Mecca, and then he, he looked in the car next to him, and there was this very handsome young man you know, with a couple of other people in, in the car, but he's sitting in the back seat. And, 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 and his passenger in the taxi said, he said, do you know who that is? And he said, I don't know. He said, that's uh, the Mahdi. And he said, oh, subhanAllah. You know, and then he kind of woke up and thought no more of it. It would be a nice dream to have, but um, you know, he still had to go out to work. And then um, a couple of days later, he was driving in Mecca, and he looked, and in the car next to him was the man that he'd seen in the dream with his, with his company. And, and you think, wow, you know, amazing. But you can't say for sure. But these are things that we know will come, will happen. Um, but we can't therefore say, oh, well, we'll wait until it happens, and then you know, things will really start happening. Uh, you know, I remember Shabbat Kala said, you know, you don't, that's not how you approach life. You don't say, well, when the Mahdi comes, everything will be fine, so we shouldn't do anything now. He said, you know, we're here to establish the deen, we're here to worship Allah, uh, that's what we're doing. And then he quotes that, that hadith uh, of, of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if, if the last day should come, and you were in the middle of planting a seed, you would complete planting the seed. Even though, in fact, it would never grow to fruition, because when the Qiyama comes, that's it. You know, end of the, end of the, of the dunya, end of the world. Nothing more to grow. You know. so, um, but that's, that shows the kind of approach that you're aware of these things that are on the horizon, but you don't build on that. You don't build on that. Um, and, and really we, I mean, also in the Hadith we have that account of, of some of the Sahaba um, being caught in a storm in the Gulf, what, what is now you know, the Gulf, and, and being washed up on an island, because you know there's several uh, islands in the Gulf, and like in the Straits of Hormuz and all these places, there are all these odd little islands. And they're blown up on one of these islands, and this funny hairy creature called the Majestasa comes to them and said, oh, I, I want to take you to my master. And he takes them to this one-eyed kind of monster in chains, in a cave, you know. And, and the, one of the questions he asked them, he said, is, has the prophet appeared in Yathrib? You know, he's using the old name of Dinas. Has this, the, the prophet appeared in Yathrib? They said, yes, we're his followers. And he said, oh, then, then my time is very close. And they said, well, who are you? He said, I'm the Dajjal. So, so, there's this almost that timeless element to the Dajjal, that he's not someone with a normal lifespan. Um, you know, he does have a, a kind of miraculous aspect, a bit like Al-Hidr, al -Hidr, you know, we say that he's the, the prophet who never dies, you know, that he, from time to time he appears. Well, not just when he met Sidna Musa, but at other times. He comes often disguised as someone in need, you know, and, and Allah tests you through him. Uh, you know, do you help him or not? You know? And I, I know there have been times when I said, well, you know, this one might be Al-Qaeda, so I'll just, like, <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> there, there is that timeless aspect. This kind of almost like an archetype. So even when you go into the mythology, the Greek mythology, you have the Cyclops, you know, this one-eyed monster. The, 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 the Jason the Argus, Argonauts, you know, if you say the, the people of, of high character, noble character, and noble deeds, and, um, have, to, have to fight with. You know, he's there, right. Back in the ages, you know, a long time ago, and in fact, the Prophet Sallallahu said, "There has never been a prophet who did not warn his people against the Dajjal." So that means that's going back to Sidna Adam, because Sidna Adam was the first prophet. So ever since Sidna Adam has been on the on the earth, 
there's been someone saying, watch out for the Dajjal. And then the Rasul said, if he comes when I'm still alive. So he was saying, I don't know when he's coming. Could be when I'm still alive with you. Then I, I will fight him with you. But, but if not, then this is what you have to do to, to make sure that you're not deceived by him. And, and, and there are things that you can do, you know, so that you, you recite Surah Al-Kaf, for example, especially the first ten ayats on the Yamul Jumat, it's confirmed protection. You can, there's the dua that, when you, you, that you can be in sajda or, or in Jalus in the prayer, that you, you seek refuge in Allah from, you know, from the, the, the testing of the grave and the fitna of the Dajjal. You know, these are well-established du'as, you probably know it by heart, I'm afraid I don't, but you, know, that you find Muslims all over the world, they know this du'a that the Prophet gave them. So, so even when they're in sajda, or, when they, you know, sometimes in, in Jerusalem, <coughs> you're behind the Imam and you finish your tayyat and he's still doing it, you, you add in another prayer, you can add in that prayer. Um, but also, the more you know about the Dajjal, the more you know about his, his um, miracles, if you like, the less likely you are to be deceived. One of his miracles is that he'll cut a young man in half and divide the two halves and then put them together. And then the man will come running and laughing and say, oh, you're the Dajjal. You know, so, um, th there's this kind of miraculous aspect to him. You can see why he deceived. You know, it's not just a simple kind of conjuring trick, you know, like which cup is the pee under this. It's a bit more subtle than that. But it's still deception. And... Um, in a way, we're just aware that the Dajjal is coming. And the Prophet me said, he said, I will tell you something which none, no other Prophet has told his people before. And that is that the Dajjal has one eye. You know, and he described it like a floating grape. So I don't know if you've ever seen a, a grape in water, just a little part of the, the spherical part of the grape is above the surface of the water. He said, like that. Um, and, and uh, you know, sometimes you see people, you think, you know. <laughs> but, but sometimes the Sahaba were like that. You know, they, they thought one man wasn't the Dajjal, they were going to beat him up, you know, until the Prophet confirmed that he wasn't. You know, so, otherwise, he probably would have had a you know, bad time. But um, you know, sometimes that's how immediate it was, even then. That's how immediate it was, even then. But, but we know enough to be able actually to recognize it. So uh, I remember once someone once asked me, he said, you know, is Bush the Dajjal? And, and, I, I said, no, he can't because he's got two eyes. I mean, they're both blind, but... <laughs> <laughs> but he's from the Ahl al-Dijad, And you can see the same with Obama as well. And I remember when he was first elected, uh, there was a t-shirt being sold in Cairo that had a picture of Obama, and underneath it said, the next pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the reality, you know, because you hear wonderful words, and, and including, we will shut down... Guantanamo Bay, you know, it, it, it's a travesty of justice. The fact that people can be kept for 10 years without charge, being tortured, being interrogated, not knowing, you know, what they're accused of, never having a trial. It, it, it's, it's not human. And, and um, you know, on, apparently on the gates of Guantanamo, they, they have their motto, honor bound to uphold the truth. And what are they doing? You know, the same with Bagram. You know, these, these are places that just get deep, you know, they get a few headlines now and then because people are being tortured on a, on a daily basis. And you hear some of the people who've managed to be extricated from it, and they've done nothing wrong. They've done nothing wrong. They were just Muslims. Someone turned them in for a few thousand dollars. And, and, and yet they were subjected to, to torture and, and interrogation. Not, not only by the CIA and, and, and Mossad and FBI, but also by the MI5, MI6, you know. Um, they were, you know, taken to other countries to be tortured. They were taken from countries all over the world. It wasn't just from Afghanistan, it was from all over the place. So it was almost like an experiment in, in how far we can stretch people without them going completely mad. It's, it's almost like a continuation of what the Nazis were doing when they were experimenting on some of the Jewish prisoners. You know, they, they conducted all these kind of experiments, um, and, and they had this kind of live uh, people to experiment on. And, and it's almost like this. So this is something that is abhorrent. You know, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of the deen. Because the Rasul said the Muslim is the one from whose hand and whose tongue you are safe. 
you know, everyone in this room, we're safe from each other, from our hands and our tongues. And, and, and if anyone attacks us, we will defend each other. You know, that, that's the reality. But uh, as Dr. Musharraf was saying earlier, they, um, reply, you know, they, their response to a bad action is an even worse action. Uh, and this is really, you could say, a description of the Ahlul Dajjal, the people of the Dajjal, the people who act like this. That it's like they don't have hearts. You know, they're heartless. They're, they're, well, I mean, in the Quran, Allah says there are hearts that are like stones, you know, and, or harder. And then there's some hearts that burst open, you know, water comes gushing out of them. And, and we've seen that, you know, you see that in the mountains, you suddenly see this really rocky place, and then out of it comes a spring of really pure water. And, and some hearts are like that, but it can be transformed. Amr ibn al you know, he said, he said, before I was a Muslim, I wanted to kill the Prophet. But he said, after Islam, there was no one more beloved to me than the Rasul. And, and what a wonderful man he was. You know, he was the one that, you know, when they were going to, to establish Kaiwan, wrote a letter to all the creepy crawlers, you know, to all the, the scorpions and the, you know, the insects that had, a, had poisonous bites. And he said, please leave because we're coming to establish a Muslim Medina. And we prefer not to have you around. You know, and they left. <laughs> this is the, it's a bit like the letter of, of Sidna Umar to the Nile, you know, to, when he stopped this kind of yearly sacrifice to you know, ensure that the, the fields would be flooded. And, 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 and you know, Umar just cut through all of that mumbo jumbo and said, you know, we worship Allah and Allah's in charge of you. Don't expect any more sacrifices. Do what you want. But remember your article to Allah. You know, so he was, you know, he wouldn't associate anything, any, any source of power with Allah. This was his great quality. I think it was funny, I mean, just coming back to the book, when I wrote it, it was, you know, I hadn't been Muslim for very long, and, and it came, really, it was written very quickly in the space of six weeks. And, and I really just sat down and wrote it, and then read through it, and made a few questions, rewrote it, read through it, made a few questions, wrote, wrote it again, and said, right, that's it. And, and then later, um, I did a, the revised edition, um, and, and I, I realized that, you know, almost every other word had been kafir. <laughs> And, <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe I was being a bit zealous, you know, maybe, but, but it was because I think, I said, oh, you yeah, know, that's kafir as well, you know, I, I think because it was what I'd been brought up to, to regard as normal. And so I kind of toned it down a bit. Um, but it was still that, that kind of freshness of, of seeing things for the first time. And it's something that Sheikh Mullah Arabi Dakawi actually writes about in his letters. He said, when meanings come to you, tether them, you know, write them down, memorize them, because... He said, first of all, they come to you, you know, like a mighty eagle, you know, it's, it's overwhelming, you know, it's so majestic. But if you don't tether them and they leave, when they come back, they'll come back as a, maybe as a kestrel, you know, and then if you don't tether it then, then when it comes back, it'll come back as a, as a pigeon, you know, until the end it won't come back. So he said, when, when meanings come to you, when, when insights come to you, tether them, write them down, you know, record them in some way. And often some of the greatest books of the Muslims are like this. You know, they, uh, Allah has given some kind of kash, some kind of unveiling to someone, and he's written it down. Even Sheikh Mamun Habib, uh, Allah be pleased with him, was a great, great Sheikh, the first Sheikh of Sheikh Bukhada. Uh, he, he was a traditional alim teaching the Karawiyan. He was a hafiz of Quran, and he was doing commentary of the Quran by the Quran, which is the highest tafsir. And, and he knew it. 